The WNBA draft was historic. It made me think about the greatest draft classes in NBA history. 1984 with Jordan, Hakeem and Barkley. 2003 with LeBron, Melo and D-Wade. People can debate all day about which draft class is the greatest, but these drafts defined eras of NBA basketball and helped make the league what it is today. And many years from now, I believe we'll be saying the same thing about the 2024 draft class for the WNBA. Here is a list of the 2020 high school recruiting class for women's college. Paige Beckers was the number one player in the country. She became national player of the year and she's gonna be the number one pick next year. Angel Reese, the number two prospect. She became a champion at LSU, was MVP of the final four. We already know all about Caitlin Clark, the greatest scorer in NCAA history. Camilla Cardoso stopped her from becoming a champion. She's on the list. She won two championships, led her team to a perfect 30 and 0 season. And then there's Cameron Brink. She won an NCAA championship too and was defensive player of the year last year year. The 2024 WNBA draft class is shaping up to be the greatest ever and it has the potential to mark a new era in women's sports. But there still isn't much draft coverage. You can't look up the strengths and weaknesses of every player the way you can for the men's, so I decided to take it upon myself to give the people a detailed scouting report and analysis on how these players fit with their new teams. It's only right with so many new fans tuning into the WNBA next season that people know what to expect from the next generation of WNBA stars. Everybody knows all about Caitlin Clark, we're gonna get back to her later, but let's start off with Angel Reese, one of the most popular players in college, second to only Bronny James in social media followers. She was drafted 7th by the Chicago Sky and a lot of people were surprised to see her fall this far in the draft. But that to me just goes to show how stacked this class really is if a player as dominant as Reese was in college is falling late in the first round. Angel Reese is one of those players you either love her or you hate her. I'm sure even Caitlin Clark fans will admit she made for a good villain in the rivalry between the two that was established in college. And that's something we all want to see continue in the WNBA. Caitlin's gonna be there, she's considered a generational talent and a player that will go on to be a superstar in the pros. But the expectation surrounding Angel Reese was very different. Everybody knows she was a great college player, but a bit like Zach Eady, some scouts don't expect her to be a star in the WNBA. Here's why they think that. Scouts have described Angel Reese as a center in a guard's body. In college, she was a dominant presence in the paint. In two seasons at LSU, Reese averaged 20.9 points, 14.9 rebounds, 2.3 assists, 1.9 steals, and 1.3 blocks per game. She also showed over 50% from the field. Check out this one right here. 25 points, 24 rebounds, 6 blocks, 4 assists and 3 steals. That's one of the most insane stat lines I've ever seen. And by looking at those numbers, you'd think Reese is a two-way Swiss army knife that can do it all on the floor. In college, that's exactly what she was, but her territory was the paint. This past season, Reese recorded a double-double in 27 of her 33 appearances. She was top 2 in the country in double doubles. Her best attribute is her rebounding. She averaged an insane 6 offensive rebounds per game last season, which was the most in all of D1 basketball. Reese is relentless on the boards on both ends and a large percentage of her points come from second chance points. But that's one of the things WNBA teams were worried about. Her size. She's listed at 6'3", which is below the average height for a WNBA center. And in college, we saw her struggle against taller players. Two of her six single-digit rebounding performances came against centers listed at 6'7 and 6'6". In college, she had a height advantage over most bigs. But in the WNBA, at the center position, she'd be battling it out with the likes of Brittany Griner, who's 6'9". Anybody who says her height is a deal breaker is lying. Brianna Stewart's one of the best WNBA centers right now. She's listed at 6'4". Alyssa Thomas leads the WNBA in rebounding at 6'2". Asia Wilson, who leads the league in blocks, is 6'4". It's not like she's too small to play the 5, but ideally she's probably best suited to play the 4 alongside a taller center. The Chicago Sky knew this. They addressed it in the draft, but more on that later. They say in order to be a successful forward, you have to be able to score outside the 
the pain, which Angel Reese currently can't do. She's a non-threat from the perimeter. Over four years in college, she attempted just 32 three-pointers and made five, averaging just over one three-pointer made a season. Surprisingly though, Reese is a good free-throw shooter. She shot 73% from the line last season, and as you can see on the screen, she improved her percentage every single year. The Chicago Sky were last in free-throw attempts last season, so this will be a big boost. And as we all know, one thing scouts look at to evaluate a player's shooting potential is how good they are at the line. And the fact that she's getting better at it is a sign that she can and will continue to improve. I know everybody shoots like Steph Curry in an empty gym, but seeing Angel Reese hit this many shots in a row is a good sign, even if the shooting form is a little off. One thing about Angel Reese as a basketball player though, when you talk about her abilities, it doesn't do her justice. The impact she has on the game on both ends is incredibly valuable, and I would compare it a little bit to Giannis Antetokounmpo. If you go attribute by attribute, he's not the best at any one thing in the NBA, but he dominates because of his non-stop motor and drive. Reese plays with a ferocity and her motor is unrivaled. She's a great athlete and gives maximum effort on every single play. A lot of her dominance, as simple as it sounds, is just pure will. Angel Reese is a big star and she needed to be in a big market. She's in one now. This was a great pick for the Chicago Sky. She has a game that resonates with Chicago sports fans and she'll become a cult hero in the Windy City. Chicago were already a top 10 rebounding team in the WNBA last season and they're going to be even better this year because not only did they draft Angel Reese with the 7th pick, they got the perfect 5 to pair her with in the front court. They drafted Camilla Cardoso with the third pick in the draft. Now if you don't know about this unstoppable 6-7 Brazilian big, then you must be living under a rock. I'm not expecting you to know that she averaged a triple-double in high school with blocked shots, but I do expect you to remember her dominant performance against Caitlin Clark in the Iowa Hawkeyes, bullying everybody in the paint and making championship winning plays all night. She finished the game with 15 points, 17 rebounds and 2 blocks. But those numbers don't do her justice. She was MVP of the Final Four and deserving so. But Cardoso didn't just have a great final series, she was fantastic all season. Aaliyah Boston was the star of the South Carolina teams of old. For the 2022 championship, she was MVP of the Final Four and went on to be the number one pick in the WNBA draft. She'll now be playing alongside you know who in Indiana. But with Boston going to the WNBA, all of a sudden Camilla Cardoso had much more responsibility. And yet the team got better and so did she individually. Camilla improved every aspect of her game statistically, especially scoring. Cardoso went from averaging 9.8 points as a junior to 14.4 points this year. As well as being a better scorer, she improved defensively too and was SEC Defensive Player of the Year for the second time in her career, averaging 2.5 blocks and just under 10 rebounds per game. She's always been efficient too and last season shot a career best 59% from the field. She put up even better numbers when it mattered most in the tournament, increasing her averages to 16.6 points, 10.1 rebounds and shooting 63% from the field. Everybody will talk about the championship game but her performance in the Sweet 16 against Indiana and Final Four against NC State were just as impressive. In both games, she had 22 points on 83% shooting along with double digit rebounds. And unlike some people have speculated with her new teammate Angel Reese, size will not be a problem for Cardoso in the W. WNBA. Among active players in the league, she's already the fourth tallest player. The presence she has as a big body in college will translate to the WNBA. She doesn't just protect the rim, she anchors the entire paint defensively and a bit like Wemby in the NBA, she discourages players from even attempting to get to the basket. We saw it in the final against the Hawkeyes. It's hard to measure fear into a statistic, but Camilla Cardoso certainly instills it in her opponent. Offensively, most of her points come from rim running and second chance points, but Cardoso is working to expand her game. She is a non-threat from the perimeter. She'd made zero three-pointers her entire college career until the SEC tournament was on the line. When down two points, seconds to go in the ball game, she did this. Cardoso for three!
Understand that South Carolina's perfect 38 0 season would not have happened without this shot. Don't be fooled though, this doesn't make her a perimeter shooter all of a sudden. Anyone can make a lucky three, but she's only ever attempted two in a game, and she made one of them. That's 50%, making her technically a 50% three point shooter. Maybe that's something she could add to her game at the next level, you never know. For the Chicago Sky spacing, it would be ideal if one of their front court players was a jump shooting threat, but Cardoso doesn't need to stretch the floor and be a three point shooter. Even just a mid range game for her would go a long way. Angel Reese is the forward is the one that needs to become a reliable shooter. Cardoso's post game isn't anything special just yet, there's potential there for her to improve though, and she does have good footwork. She's definitely far from a finished product. Her offensive game needs some polishing still, but there's a lot to like about her as a player. You can't teach 6 7. She's big, strong, can dunk, rebound, block shots. She takes all the boxes WNBA teams are looking for in a center. She knows what it takes to win. She was a key piece in a program that lost just three games in three years. She's won two NCAA championships, and she'll be playing alongside another winner in Angel Reese, somebody she went to war with for years, dating all the way back to high school. This time, they'll be plotting how to win a championship together in the WNBA instead of against each other in college. And I tell you what, something we want to see down the line is an Indiana Finals matchup with Chicago. We want to see if Caitlin Clark can get her revenge on Angel Reese and Camilla Cardoso, the two players who beat her in the finals in college. I'm telling you right now, that would break all kind of viewing records and that rivalry is a matchup we need to see in the WNBA one day. Since we brought her up again, let's talk about Caitlin Clark so we can focus on the rest of the draft class. That's why you need to subscribe to the channel, we cover everybody fairly. Everybody knows when it comes to Caitlyn, she moves the needle. Everybody talks about her influence on the women's game and the impact she's going to have in terms of bringing eyeballs to the sport. If you want to hear about that, you're going to have to watch our last video explaining why I think she's going to be the next face of basketball. We're going to talk about her basketball and her fit with her new team. The Indiana Fever, as a shock to absolutely nobody, took Caitlyn Clark number one in the draft. But what kind of impact is she expected to have? Some people think she's going to come to the WNBA, be MVP of the league and win a championship year one. Others think she's going to come to the W and get exposed by all these salty older players who are jealous of the attention she's getting. Kind of like when Lonzo Ball was welcomed to the NBA by Pat Beverly, his debut game in LA. The Indiana Fever have been the worst WNBA team for years now. This is the second year in a row they've drafted number one and the third time in three years they've had a top two pick. They finished with a 13-27 record last season, but they are a young team with some good young players. Last year's number one pick Aaliyah Boston from South Carolina, she averaged 14.5 points and 8.4 rebounds. Nalissa Smith, who they drafted number two in 2022, she's putting up 15.5 points and 9.2 rebounds. That's a solid young front court to build around, and they also have some scoring in the backcourt. Kelsey Mitchell led the team in scoring last year who a lot like Caitlin, was one of the greatest scorers in college basketball history. Her scoring translated to the next level and she's an all-star averaging 18 points per game. So the Fever already have some talent, allowing Caitlin Clark to come in right away and make them better. Despite having all these scorers, Indiana ranked 11 of 12 teams in assist rate. Caitlin Clark averaged 8.9 assists per game last season, the most in women's college basketball. She was top 5 in double doubles because of her assists. Everybody focuses so much on her scoring and shooting, they forget that she's a generational passer as well. She's third all time in assists. And playing alongside better players, there's no reason why she can't average double digit assists in the WNBA. People would be surprised to know that Caitlin Clark's 3 point percentage in college wasn't actually that high. But that's going to change because for the first time in her career, she's going to be able to play off the ball. Kelsey Mitchell is a scoring threat that requires defensive attention, and that will result in Caitlin having easier looks than she ever had in college. Because at Iowa, Caitlin Clark was the only real scoring threat. Now if you leave Kelsey open to double team Clark, the only thing that's going to happen is Clark will have more assists and less points. And if you choose not to send a double team and allow Caitlin Clark to play 1v1, then that's not going to end too well either. The Indiana Fever are desperately going to need Caitlin Clark shooting. Kelsey Mitchell was the only player to attempt more than 100 three-pointers for them last season. The point guard she's replacing in the starting lineup 
Erica Wheeler. She averaged 10 points and 5 assists last season and shot 30% from 3 point range on less than 3 attempts per game. You replace her with a generational passer and generational shooter in Caitlin Clark with Steph Curry range? That's one heck of an upgrade because it opens up the floor for everyone. It changes their spacing, it makes them dangerous from the perimeter and gives more space inside for the Fever's front court players to be even more dominant. Caitlin Clark is a special talent. I expect her to come in, be rookie of the year and lead the Indiana Fever to the playoffs year one. I don't expect her to average 31.6 points per game like she did in college, although I wouldn't be surprised if she did. She probably will at some point, but not year one. She's going to come in, make everybody better, be more efficient and take this team to the next level. The WNBA season is just getting started, so if you want to watch the games live, click the link down below in the description. It's free, 100% legal, and there you can watch the games and enjoy some great basketball. You know, for all the hype this draft class is getting, not enough people are talking about the number 2 pick, Cameron Brink. The 6'4 forward with a 6'8 wingspan is a defensive prodigy, and that's why the LA Sparks passed up on the star names we mentioned earlier to get her. Cameron Brink could have gone to UConn, played alongside Paige Beckers, and been a part of the most successful program in women's college basketball. Instead, she took a different path and made a name for herself at Stanford, a decision that paid off, as in her freshman year year, she won a national championship and played a starting role on that team. And over her four years, she has been the best defensive player in the country. Brink was Pac-12 Defensive Player of the Year three times, and this past year as a senior, she was Naismith Defensive Player of the Year, which is given to the best defender in the entire country. Cameron Brink is a generational shot blocker. She averaged 3.7 blocks per game her senior year, and over 3 per game for her entire college career, totaling over 400 blocks blocks in 4 years. That's insane. Remember, she's a forward, not a center. But just because she's a generational defensive player, doesn't mean she isn't a great two-way player. Because she is. As a senior, she averaged 17.4 points per game. She shot 51% from the field and 30% from the three-point line. By no means is she a knockdown shooter. She attempted about two per game, but she has consistently hit them at a decent percentage over her four years in college. Brink is a fantastic free throw shooter. 84% is as good as it gets. Caitlin Clark, probably the best shooter in the country, she shoots 86%. I don't know about you, but if my front court players are hitting shots at a similar rate to her, then I'm feeling good about that. But shooting is just a small part of Cameron Brink's well-rounded game. She's probably the most versatile player in the draft. Remember, at 6'4", she's the same height as WNBA centers, and yet she's mobile and well-coordinated. Offensively, she has a balanced skill set. She understands the fundamentals, has good footwork, and she's one of the most efficient post players in the country. Of all players with 200 or more post possessions, she ranks in the top 3. Another underrated aspect of her game is her passing. She averaged just under 3 assists per game last season, but showed some real promise passing out of the post, but also finding her teammates off the dribble. Listen, as good as she is, and as good as she will be, she isn't physically a WNBA player just yet. She needs to put on some muscle and her frame needs to fill out, but in terms of a prospect, Cameron Brink has the potential to be the best two-way player in this draft class. Defensively, she's going to come to the W and have an impact right away. The Sparks were last in opponent's field goal percentage. Brink will change that. The Sparks were also 11th in rebounding per game. That will change too. Rebounding is one of Brink's greatest strengths. She was top 3 in college in rebounds per game. She even averaged more rebounds per game than Cardoso. I know a lot of people are wondering, particularly the casual mainstream audience, if she's so good, where was she during this year's March Madness? Well, she stupidly fouled out of her last game with minutes to go and that was the end of her college career. She'll not lose sleep over that though, she already won a championship in college. One more thing about Brink though, is she'll talk smack. Right here you see her going back and forth with Rakea Jackson after blocking her shot. These two are gonna have to squash their beef because they're going to be playing alongside each other for the Sparks next season because with the 4th pick in the draft, the Sparks selected Rakea Jackson from Tennessee. At 6'2", she's considered the best wing prospect in this draft, and the Sparks believe that pairing her alongside Brink can really kickstart their rebuild and make them a competitive team again in the near future. 
Jackson is a scorer. She averaged 20.2 points per game last season and she's one of just 5 SEC players to average 20 points and 5 rebounds over multiple seasons. She is an explosive athlete with a quick first step who can score inside and out. She made 51% of her 2 pointers and 34% of her 3 pointers. She's been a pro for a while now with a mature offensive game beyond her years. To highlight how good she is, did you know when playing against Team USA in a scrimmage last year, she was the leading scorer in the game with 15 points? Think about it, if a college player can hold her own with Team USA players that's made up of WNBA stars, then what chance does the average WNBA player have of stopping her next season? Her transition to the W will be pretty seamless. Some people are already picking her to be Rookie of the Year because they expect her to score so many points. Jackson is one of those players who makes difficult contested shots. She's a free level scorer who can get to the basket, pull up in the mid range or knock down shots from the perimeter. Don't sleep on her rebounding either. She averaged 8.2 a game last season, 2.3 assists. She has more to her game, but I expect her to be a go to scorer who gets buckets all over the court. Her go to move is the turnaround fadeaway on the block. She likes to take advantage of smaller defenders in the post. She gets to her spots with ease. She's a shot creator off the dribble who is most comfortable operating in the mid range. She can blow by a defender, finish at the basket. If she's fouled, she'll go to the line, hit close to 80% of her free throws. And she can also step out and hit from deep, spotting up or off the dribble. And when you talk about the biggest winners from the 2024 WNBA draft, some people will say Chicago got the big names, but LA got the better players. Let me know who you think won the draft down below in the comments. Did anyone notice another familiar face went top 6 in the draft? Aaliyah Edwards might be most famous for setting the most controversial screen in women's college basketball history, but she's actually one of the most exciting prospects in the draft and she's headed to the capital to play with the Mystics. The Yukon Huskies women's basketball program has a great track record of producing great WNBA players, and a lot of people are expecting that from Edwards. It didn't happen for her right away at Yukon. She had to work her way up from a freshman, be efficient in the time she got, she did so, averaging 10.7 points per game on 69% shooting from the field. Once she became a starter her junior year, she never looked back. Over the last two seasons, she's averaged similar numbers, around 17 points per game, 9 rebounds, a block, a steal, she's shooting 60% from the field. She was a huge reason the Huskies made the Final Four. And although it was her illegal screen that ended up costing them a chance to win the championship, Edwards had a dominant performance against Iowa. She had 17 points, 8 rebounds and 3 assists. Her two women game in the pick and roll with Paige Beckers is a sign of what's to come in the WNBA. She's great at setting screens, depending on who's officiating. She rolls well and can finish through contact. She knows exactly how to be a pro. Scouts have tipped Edwards as one of the most WNBA ready players in the draft, not just because of the fact she's been preparing for this for years at UConn, but because she has the experience playing with the Canadian national team with and against pros at the Olympics. We know she's ready to compete right now, but long term she can be a star. She's very athletic, strong and quick for her size at 6'3". She's a powerful player, especially in the post with a great touch around the rim. She can finish with either hand, is mobile and full of energy. She's fast enough to get up and down in the open court, gets out quickly in transition and can finish. But she's also a very good rebounder. Just because she isn't averaging as many as Cameron Brink or Angel Reese doesn't mean she doesn't crash the boards. She can. She averages 2.5 offensive rebounds per game and she'd probably get more rebounds defensively if she wasn't running and gunning with the guards in transition. The Mystics struggled on the glass last season, ranked 10th in the WNBA. Edwards is going to come in and help fix that. One of her biggest strengths offensively is her mid-range game, and the fact that she's a scoring threat from outside the paint opens the lane up for her to drive where at the college level she was hard to stop. Much like Angel Reese, she has a high motor, plays with energy and intensity. She's a rim runner, always chasing second chance points and defensively, she's impactful too. She averaged over 2 stocks per game last season, she gets steals in the passing lanes, blocks shots at the rim. Overall, she's just a very WNBA ready player. She was a 5 in college, will probably play the 4 in the W. She's ready to go right now, nice player and nice pick from Washington. 
Did I mention that there was a player drafted before Edwards? She was taken number 6 and taken at number 5 was the smallest player in the lottery, JC Sheldon, a 5'10 combo guard from Ohio State. Unlike most other teams in this WNBA draft, the Dallas Wings are competitive. They finished with the 4th best record in the W last season, they made it to the semi-finals and only lost to the eventual champion Las Vegas Aces. For a college player, Sheldon is experienced. She played 5 years at Ohio State, made several all-conference teams, was a second team All-American and was the 6th top scorer in school's history. Last season, she averaged 17.8 points per game. She shot 50% from the field, but most importantly, especially for the Wings, who ranked dead last in 3 point percentage last season, she hits 37% of 3 balls on over 5 attempts per game. She also averaged 3.8 assists last season, and over 5 years in college, she's averaged over 2 steals per game. She's very aggressive defensively, picks up players full court, forces turnovers, and applies pressure to the ball handlers. JC Sheldon is very fast and despite being around the same height as Isaiah Thomas, she's actually considered a big guard. The average height of a point guard in the WNBA is 5 foot 8, which gives her an advantage. Now for an off guard, she might be a little more challenged physically, but whatever she lacks up in height, she'll make up for it in speed. Sheldon is a great scorer, she plays at a fast pace, has a great combination of size, speed and athleticism, she's a great slasher, finishes well around the rim and can make pull up jumpers. JC Sheldon isn't a star name like the other players on this list, not yet anyway, but there's a reason she went top 5 in the draft. She's a great prospect and somebody who will come into the league and make an impact right away. She has the maturity in the game right now to come in and be a starter for a Wings team that are looking to be competitive again. We just talked about the smallest player, so let's end the video talking about the biggest player. And when I say biggest, I don't mean tallest. Alyssa Paley is a 6'2 forward, but that weight advantage she has over her opponents is possibly her biggest strength and it makes her the biggest mystery in this draft. Nobody knew if she was going to be selected in the first round or later on, but the Minnesota Lynx took a gamble and selected her with the 8th pick. They were a playoff team with the 6th best record in the W last season. But let me tell you about Elisa Peely's story, it's crazy. Growing up in Alaska, Peely played a bunch of different sports. She was a wrestler, footballer. All through her younger years, she was a girl playing with boys. During her time in high school, she won 13 state titles across multiple sports. She did this while being a linebacker for the boys football team, but for basketball, Elisa Peely was the three-time Gatorade player of the year in her state. She led her school to two state championships, was a five-star prospect, and was named female high school athlete of the year by Max Preps two years in a row. Elisa Peely is truly a generational female athlete. She could have gone pro in multiple sports. And in basketball, despite being doubted every step of the way, she's dominated at every level. She played four years of college basketball, starting off at USC and then transferring to Utah. Her last two years in college, she became one of the most dominant players in the nation. Combining her stats over the last two seasons, she's averaged 21.2 points per game, 6.1 rebounds, 2.4 assists, a steal and 0.8 blocks. Her scoring efficiency is off the charts. She made 61.5% of her two pointers, shoots 81% at the line and that jumper expands out to the three point line. Peely shot 41% from the perimeter on four attempts per game. Last season she was Pac-12 player of the year, she helped lead Utah to the second round of the NCAA tournament and over the course of the season she had some huge performances. 37 points on 65% shooting against the undefeated South Carolina. Against the Trojans, her former team, she had 37 again, this time on 13 of 16 shooting. She's shown time and time again that she can compete with the best. A lot of people doubted her in this draft, whether or not her game will translate to the pros. But the way I see it, is if someone is this good at sports, I can't see any way they don't make it in the one sport they decide to dedicate all their time to and pursue. It's going to be interesting to see if she can be as dominant physically at the next level. I just think she's going to find a way some way. But as for the rest of the draft, Nika Mule, who defended Caitlin Clark in the final four, she was drafted in the second round. And as mentioned earlier, Katie Martin came to the draft to support Caitlin, her teammate at Iowa, and ended up getting drafted herself. 
I know you're probably wondering why we only talked about 8 of the 12 first round picks. I originally planned on covering the first 10, but I'll be honest, I love European basketball, I cover it here on the channel a lot, but I'm not tapped into the women's game unless it's Holly Winterburn winning the Euro Cup for the London Lions. There was two guards drafted out of France, I couldn't tell you which one is better, I'm just hoping they don't end up like Killian Hayes and Theo Maladon, the last two guard prospects to come out of France, who ended up out of the NBA by 23. Anyways, I hope you're excited for the new WNBA season. If you've made it up to this point, you obviously enjoyed, so check out another video. And on that note, it's DKM signing out. Until next time, and peace.